And so in our position, we do need Tao. We do need God. You know, you've heard people say before that you have a God-shaped hole in you. You're going to fill it, fill it with everything but God until you find God. This is why people say like, oh, all paths lead to God because it's like we have that spiritual muscle, okay? Like it's not going away because you have all these cool things to distract yourself with. A wise man once said that if you want to be a master in life, you must submit to a master. Welcome back to this series on the Tao Te Ching, where we're going over each individual chapter of Taoism's most important text. So if you're new here, I recommend going to my channel where I have all the videos in a playlist up to date in an order for you to watch. So without further delay, reading from the Jafu Feng and Jane English translation of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, here is chapter 27. A good walker leaves no tracks. A good speaker makes no slips. A good reckoner needs no tally. A good door needs no lock yet no one can open it. Good binding requires no knots, yet no one can loosen it. Therefore the wise take care of everyone and abandon no one. They take care of all things and abandon nothing. This is called following the light. What is a good person? The teacher of a bad person. What is a bad person? A good person's charge. If the teacher is not respected and the student not cared for, confusion will arise, however clever one is. This is the crux of mystery. So in the first part here, that a good walker leaves no tracks, good speaker makes no slips, good reckoner needs no tally, good door needs no lock, yet no one can open it. A good binding requires no knots, yet no one can loosen it. Again, this is very common throughout this book. <laughs> this all sounds like complete contradiction. How can you walk and leave no tracks. How could you make a binding, but they're not being knots? You know, this on a surface level, it's like what on earth is being talked about here. Well, what is good and what is great by Taoist standards is a very, very, very neutral kind of stance on things in reality. Not that you stay within that neutral stance at all times. You know, there's a saying, only thing in the middle of the road is yellow lines and roadkill. That's not what this is talking about. It's that what is good and great is most close to the natural way of things, the natural essence of how we are. And by doing this, we won't really need the walls that have been put up in our lives. And a good way to kind of understand a lot of the language being used here is that you can imagine somebody on, on, on the other extreme, like somebody who walks through the woods and they're like ripping through the place like a tornado. Like you can obviously tell that they've been there whether they're chopping trees down as they're walking or they're, you know, like I said, some kind of like force that it's very, very obvious that you were there. You don't want to be like that. You want to be like somebody who, when you walk through nature, when you go through, you kind of don't want to be either this destructive force, this center of attention. You kind of want to not necessarily just be invisible, but to pretty much be this neutral force, leaving no tracks, talking, making no slips. This is about neutrality. This is about honesty. This is about unattachment. And I like what's said here about like a good door and a good binding, you know, not needing a knot or a lock. And it's like, what kind of door, what kind of thing like that? What kind of thing is like that? You know, and the first thing that I think of is faith. I think of internal things, you know, like there's such this concern about what is going on between our ears, you know, what is going on in our heads, because that can't be taken down with, you know, a hypersonic missile, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what you can't really kill an idea that easily. So of course, this is kind of another reference to the internal. I mean, this goes to what is also said in this book and that if, you, if you're not attached to anything, you can't really be robbed. And you can also think about it, like I think with the door example, I think like when Jesus Christ said that the kingdom of God is within you, well, that's not a, the king, the door to the kingdom of God is not something that you can forcefully take down. Like you can have all the military force in the world, but you can't break down the door to the kingdom of God. It can only be accessed through faith and love. And a knot that can't be undone, that again is like this, this metaphysical parallel to the you know physical counterparts. Cause it's like, what kind of binding, of course any binding can be undone, even if it's metal chains. It's like, okay, well, we're not talking about that. It's more of a metaphysical knot. 
Therefore, the wise take care of everyone and abandon no one. They take care of all things and abandon nothing. This is called following the light. So because followers of the Tao, we recognize that everything is interconnected in this sense, there is no room for abandoning life. There's no room for abandoning anything because we no longer have these lines that were drawn between people. It's all interconnected, it's all one. Nothing gets abandoned here. Nothing is con condemned, pretty much. And again, I always gotta say, it's not like in like being a bastard kind of way, like anything goes, but it's seeing it from everything from a neutral kind of perspective. And you know, like here, like following the light, you know, that's something that we've hear, heard all the time in like movies and books, like following the light, that kind of thing. It's another reference to what is the highest virtue? What is the greatest virtue? Taking care of all things, abandoning no one, abandoning nothing. It's really similar to what you see you know, in the Gospels of Christ, you see this like perfect kind of figure being like water. Water abandons nothing and it's needed for life. So what is a good person? The teacher of a bad person. What is a bad person? A good person's charge. So this part is really, really great because it's going back to how opposites are ultimately creating each other, but it's giving it to us in the context of teachers and students. So if you look at it from a very you know, you look at it from a Taoist kind of lens, whoever is doing the teaching, no matter what their stances are, it's kind of assumed falsely, right, that they are always the right one, or they're the good ones. And that the, the students, even though that they didn't do anything wrong, they're already kind of considered bad because they haven't learned the good yet. Of course, this is when non-duality and amorality kind of come into the picture and you're kind of throwing that aside. You think of a lot of people, and we've all met people like this, who they kind of feel like they have nothing to learn, nothing left to learn, that they, they've kind of reached this point of like ultimate intellectual good or whatever, that they kind of have this arrogance that, you know, everybody has something to learn from them, but they have nothing to learn from other people. And that's like the epitome of, <laughs> of this kind of example here. And you can look at like right now, like the culture wars that are happening you know, in the Western world, that you have things that are being taught now that for thousands of years were automatically considered bad. But today, because they're being taught and they're being more represented, they're automatically considered good without question. Now, what's the problem with that? Now, this is where they go wrong, that they're still using this system of good and bad. They're still having this implication of polarity in order to make their side the definition of good, their worldview as the definition of good. And as long as you have this polarity, it's not going to work out because <laughs> you're automatically creating the opposition. Like I said, by definition, whoever is doing the teaching, there's this automatic assumption that they are good. They're already assumed to be better, holier than thou, so to speak. And this is kind of why we call a bad teacher like a bad teacher is a really bad teacher like you know and it's it, it, there's such a responsibility for a teacher because it's like for a bad teacher you're basically like you're making a neutral force which is a child worse you're not making them better <laughs> and that's kind of the problem when it's like you have you know teachers that are automatically considered as right or good and you know this goes for all of society you know and if, and we kind of know this now like a lot of people are pretty aware that it's like you should have you should as always assume that you know that the other person might know something that you don't know this is something that's talked about a lot these days but instead people kind of have this attitude that the the teacher is always considered good or right but that's not always the case we know that so if the teacher is not respected and the student not cared for confusion will arise However clever one is, this is the crux of mystery. So if we have bad people that don't respect the good, but then we also have good people who do not care for the bad, so to speak, we all remain in utter confusion. So now it gets flipped on its head. So it's not to say that just because we have these definitions and these polarities that we should throw the whole thing out the window. It's like, no, 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 no. It's not dictating whether or not something is is good or bad or things like that. 
It's your perspective on how you see it. Because when you completely take away all standards in society, which of course are they're used for our convenience, and you take all of those things away and it just becomes this kind of clown world, well, then you have sheer, utter confusion. You have disorder. You have all these kids who are like, I don't know what, I don't know left from right. You know, everything's just kind of a weird dopamine hit. And we see that in today's culture where everything is just kind of distractions and confusion. And what's so important about this is that no matter how clever we are, no matter how intellectual we are, no matter how fast our devices are or anything, you know, anything like that, we still deal with the same consequences. We still repeat history when we forget the Tao. And you know, why does this happen? Ultimately, because of our egos, because we have this urge now, you know, with all this materialism and technology that we're going to become our own masters, we're going to become our own gods. But it doesn't really work like that. Because in some sense, and I mentioned this in a previous video that it's like reality, so to speak, is kind of a theocracy in a way there's a there's a hierarchical spiritual um, nature to to reality as far as we know it and at this point it can't really be denied and so in our position we do need doubt we do need god you know you've heard people say before that you have a god-shaped hole in you you're going to fill it fill it with everything but god until you find god this is why people say like oh all paths lead to god because it's like we have that spiritual muscle okay like it's not going away because you have all these cool things to distract yourself with a wise man once said that if you want to be a master in life you must submit to a master 